I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm running the game under HDR now, so the monitor's also running in HDR. You'll notice that there is a lot of control that you still get under HDR on this monitor. You can adjust the brightness, you can also adjust the colour channels, that kind of thing, the gamma. I wouldn't recommend you fiddle with any of this or don't make extensive adjustments with any of this because it's really going to pull things away from the intended look for HDR10 content, which is the format that this monitor supports. If you're really finding it uncomfortably bright, then yes, you can reduce brightness a bit. If you reduce the brightness a lot, then things really start to look quite faded and washed out. It doesn't just neatly map everything to a lower peak brightness or anything like that. So it's really designed to be run at full brightness. If you need to decrease that a little bit, by all means do. And with the colour channels, if you notice obvious tints, then you can get rid of them by making colour channel adjustments. So that's a nice flexibility to have, but don't go too extreme with those adjustments either. So I've got the local dimming set to high. It works in much the same way as I explained with SDR. Low is, again, really the undynamic setting. You can have a play with that if you want, but um, it really doesn't make good use of the local dimming solution, in my opinion. High, on the other hand, does. Auto does as well. Auto and high are quite similar to one another. The high setting does give a bit of extra brightness to some of the HDR highlights, but there's not a huge amount in it, to be honest, not a huge difference. And rather than me just talk extensively at the start of this section, I think it'd be better if I just show you some numbers, because I know some people absorb information better with a bit of numerical context. So with this graph, you can see the monitor running with the high, auto and low settings. The peak luminance is achieved with the high and the auto setting at a 4% window, 4% patch. So that means 4% of the screen is showing white, the rest of the screen is showing black in this particular test. So it's a white patch surrounded by black. You can also see in general that the low setting is just lower in terms of its luminance levels throughout the range. The reason that you don't get that peak luminance straight away with a 1% patch or 1% window. Remember that it's a white patch surrounded by black. And with the dark biasing of the local dimming, it does drag the white luminance down. But it does maintain good brightness levels for 4% patch, 9% patch. It starts to dim again at 25% a bit, but it's still reasonably bright. And by 49% and 100%, it dims more significantly. So what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that the monitor is able to pump out nice luminance levels, where there's even a reasonably high amount of brightness on the screen, but still a mixed scene, really. So for this scene here, the local dimming, first of all, it does work very effectively to deepen those dark shades. There's a nice atmospheric look there. It doesn't give you OLED level precision, so ideally you would have even more depth for the sort of cracks in the rocks and the joins in the rocks, that kind of thing but it has to compromise because it's not just showing pure black here. So there's a little bit of lifting up of shades, but it does, does pretty well though. It does pretty well in this respect. And also the dark to medium shades are nice and deep as well. If you look carefully, you might be able to see a little bit of haloing or blooming around the cursor there and the HUD elements. I have to say that the camera exaggerates it quite a lot around the HUD elements there. To the eye, it's far more subtle than it appears on the camera, but it does indeed show that it exists. The blooming, the haloing, it's also somewhat more noticeable towards the bottom of the screen and the side edges. It's sort of viewing angle dependent. If you look at the viewing angles video and you look at the dark desktop where I turn local dimming on, you'll see a quite extreme example of that. So anyway, the bright shades here, nice and bright, the dark shades, nice and dim. So it really does give a dynamic experience for this kind of scene. It does work well overall. And to be honest, it's well above average for an LCD in terms of its performance here. And actually, if you think about the peak brightness levels, sort of just a bit above 1,300 nits, and it's actually still above 1,000 nits according to my measurements, even at a 25% white window. OLEDs will have dimmed a lot more by then, so OLED models like the ASUS PG42UQ and the Dell Alienware AW3423DW, they would dim more aggressively. So even with this scene here, for example, the brightness here, they would dim quite noticeably at this point. There is a bit of dimming if I zoom in here because the bright shades do start to dominate a bit. So it isn't as bright as it could be all the time. There is a noticeable difference between that and that. And remember that the camera is making its own adjustments, so you're not getting an accurate depiction of this with the camera. But there are certainly shifts there. Still pretty bright though. I'm just going to dive into this. I will show you some scenes from some other games, because I do like a bit of variety here. 
So this scene here is one I quite like for testing HDR. It just sort of easily separates decent HDR performers from not so decent HDR performers. And the ability for it to pump out a good amount of brightness is very evident with the glare on the water surface there. Again, can't appreciate this in the video. And also there's more detail there. There's not a huge ball of light as it looks like in the video. There's more detail. The light streaming up above there as well, more detail. I'm just going to take a little sidebar here and mention a few things because I didn't mention them earlier on. First of all, I'm using an RTX 3090 at the moment and I tested this monitor via HDMI as well as DisplayPort. Very similar experience. And I've also tested it with an AMD GPU and again HDMI and DisplayPort there and compared to the NVIDIA counterpart, very similar. So the monitor is very consistent with its HDR performance across different GPUs. And remember that as a games console user, you're going to be connected via HDMI and you'll have AMD hardware. And that's why I like to test not just NVIDIA with DisplayPort, but do more extensive testing. So yes, nice and consistent there. Another thing I like to mention, 10-bit color reproduction haven't mentioned so far, the monitor does support that natively and that is put to good use with HDR10 content such as this. So you get a, an enhanced nuanced shade variety for these nice dark shades there for example. It allows the colour gamut to be put to good use, the fairly wide colour gamut. And it also gives you gentler gradients, gentler, more natural looking progressions of shades for weather effects and that kind of thing. So you can see that here. Unfortunately you can't see that in the video but I can see it to my eye. So that all works very nicely. And again, Perpixel Illumination would help give even more depth to some of these dark shades, but it does maintain a nice solidity to the medium shades there, good depth, good depth to the dark shades and the bright shades shown at the same time, nice and bright in this particular scene. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm on this really very bright dominated scene. It's not entirely bright, it's not just sort of pure white or anything like that. You can see it is mixed, but it does bias more towards these bright shades. This is a scene I showed you with the ASUS PG32 UQX, and that is an extremely capable monitor when it comes to HDR brightness. That really does set a benchmark in my mind in terms of HDR brightness performance. And this scene was incredibly bright there. That actually peaks up to around 2000 nits and it can sustain 1,200 nits. That means even if the screen was showing pure white for a prolonged period of time, it would be able to sustain incredible luminance there. As you can see from the measurements, this model just doesn't provide that kind of experience. And in this scene here, it is still bright. And if I compare it to the Dell Alienware, which the QD OLED, which I also tested with this scene briefly, and I sort of drew the comparison with the ASUS there as well. The Samsung here really stands somewhere between those two, the Alienware and the ASUS. Remember the ASUS is a mini LED IPS model, it isn't OLED. So it does sustain decent brightness levels, but when I look at the sun there, for example, with the sky in the background, it isn't super bright, not by HDR standards. And the glow around the clouds as well, isn't quite as bright as it could be, quite as bright and brilliant. The reflections of the light on the icy surface down there as well, again, not as brilliant as it could be. So if I compare to the glare on the, or glint of light on the water surface in that Shadow of the Tomb Raider scene I just showed you, there isn't that kind of impact with these bright shades anymore. But it doesn't look dull either. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5. This is one which I've used recently when I reviewed the BenQ EX 3210U. This is another scene which I quite like to use actually to talk about HDR performance. It's quite varied and it does kind of highlight various different strengths and weaknesses with this model. So the BenQ, it doesn't offer the peak luminance that this one does. It doesn't have anywhere near the same local dimming capability. So this scene just looks quite washed out, quite flooded in many respects. Whereas on the Samsung, it's more impressive, although not up to OLED levels of impressiveness, and I'll come on to that a little bit shortly. But certainly when you look at the light there, very bright indeed. And again, the 10-bit color reproduction helps with the nuanced shade variety. That's all nice as well. There's some good bright areas in the background as well, although because of the dark biasing of the local dimming, they are pulled down a little bit. And something I'm just gonna come on to, glowing embers here. This is something which is more impressive on OLED models, actually. And that's because this area directly surrounding the embers, there is a bit of haloing 
Um, I mean, there's a natural glow from the game just because of the graphics and how they've done this. So the haloing is not really a big issue. But again, there's that dark biasing. So the embers aren't really as bright and brilliant as they could be. And I've actually seen them looking brighter on the Dell Alienware, for example. They become actually a bit more impressive when they're a bit larger. So I'm a bit closer to them here. But they're not as eye-catching as you might expect, given the peak luminance capabilities of this monitor. But that's again, that's a compromise that's made. Alternatively, if the monitor decided not to dark bias with the local dimming, there'd be more halos, they'd be more obvious. Dark shades would be lifted up too much a lot of the time. So it's a compromise either way. And that's, again, an area where OLED models are really very strong with their per pixel illumination. But I would say overall, the local dimming solution with its 1196 zones, it does a lot better than most LCDs under HDR. I know that's not really saying much, but I've tested quite a few of varying HDR levels. And for, for mixed content like this, yes, there is a bit of dragging down of some of the bright shades, but overall, it is a nice dynamic and engaging HDR experience it gives here. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I was going to show you some cyberpunk, but to be completely honest, the scenes I was going to show you, I've really covered this with scenes with Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Battlefield 5, and this video is already more than long enough, so I really don't want to go there. So I'm going to focus more on the colour reproduction side of things here. The monitor's gamut, as I showed you, 91% DCI-P3, it depends on your measurement software and measurement instruments. Some reviewers may get a little bit more than that, but either way, it does not cover the same amount of Rec 2020 as models like the Dell Alienware AW3423DW and nowhere near as much as the ASUS PG32UQX. So it doesn't have the same level of vibrancy, even the potential level of vibrancy. Then you have to factor in those saturation losses lower down the screen towards the edges, which I've mentioned, and that takes a little bit away from it as well. So it doesn't look as vibrant as those, but it doesn't look washed out either. And again, the local dimming solution really helps here, keeps these medium shades nice and solid looking overall. And with the color gamut still being reasonably wide, yes, it doesn't really fully satisfy the DCI-P3 requirements and comes where, nowhere near Rec 2020. So remember that under HDR, for HDR10 content, the developers have these wider color gamuts in mind. They're not targeting sRGB anymore. They don't have sRGB in mind most of the time. They really do have these wider color spaces in mind. So it's nice to have really good coverage of those. This monitor instead offers reasonable DCI-P3 coverage, but nothing beyond that. So what does that mean? Well, the green shades here, fairly vibrant, not as vibrant as I've seen them, but they don't look washed out. They do have good pop. And also because they're actually targeted in these wider color spaces, you don't get the kind of overdone yellowish greens or some overly bright greens that you get under SDR. So there's actually more depth and some of the more muted shades do look more muted, more appropriate in that respect. Lara's skin as well. It looks a bit overdone under SDR, but under HDR, it's toned down, looks more appropriate. Although there is a bit of loss of saturation towards the bottom there, so her legs there look a little bit paler than they should. So yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it looks washed out at all. It's just that com if you do draw comparisons with some of these other models, certainly I've tested a lot of models which are very vibrant under HDR, nothing like that. But it's still above average in terms of the overall vibrancy. I know I just, sorry, I laugh when I say that because at the average HDR performer, I mean, when it comes to monitors, that's really not very impressive. It's not a very high benchmark. This is well above that. Though. So you're not really gonna play around on this monitor under HDR. You're not gonna look at the colors and think, oh, this looks washed out. Doesn't, and I mean, it depends on what you're coming from, I guess what you're used to, but no, it doesn't really look washed out at all. So I think overall, this is, a nice dynamic HDR performer. There are some good pulses of brightness. It dims very effectively. The color gamut's decent enough to give some good vibrancy as well, and it's used appropriately under HDR. I don't have any particular issues with Samsung's implementation of the local dimming. I think they've done well to dark bias. That's a personal preference, I guess. Maybe there could have been some other settings which bias more one way or the other. It gives decent brightness for mixtures of bright and dark shade for really bright dominant content, then yes, things could be a bit brighter. So again, coming back to that really flawed notion of the average HDR performer, this monitor is really well above that.